Hello. Nice to be back. So Grab, if you don't know it, is one of those companies that runs taxis and bikes and food delivery and parcel delivery and social carpooling. There's a Grab Hitch as well as a Grab Express and a Grab Food. And it does it in six countries in Southeast Asia, from Malaysia and Vietnam to Indonesia and Thailand. And you may have heard of other companies in this market that are growing quite aggressively, um, which may be why Paddy and his team have called this session Staying Ahead in the Real-Time Taxi Wars. And in the front line, in the war leading for Grab, um, is co-founder Tan Hui Ling, who I'm very pleased to welcome here, working out of Singapore. Just for people who don't know Grab, explain what's different about you from other car hailing services. Yes, yeah, so, well, this is pretty loud. Um, to start with, I think one of the main differences is how we actually started Grab. Um, we actually started focused specifically on one issue in a country called Malaysia, which is safety of taxis. Um, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur has a reputation for one of the worst taxi services. I used to have to use it. It was super unsafe. My mom used to stay up late at night trying to track where I was before GPS was invented, right? Think about a whole bunch of SMSs, calls, uh, different landmarks, ETAs that were done manually. Uh, that was how Grab started. Because it was something that we thought needed real change. And when you say unsafe, you don't mean the drivers driving too fast, you meant personal safety. Exactly. Um, so I meant things like, as a female drive, uh, passenger, I would fear for my own personal safety whether I would be robbed, potentially raped. Um, there were some very basic issues around the fact that drivers would actually go about roundabout on the meter trying to take you for a free ride. Uh, many different things in Malaysia and the taxi industry weren't working well at that point in time. And so what happened was my co-founder and I, Anthony, um, we met at B-School at HBS. I personally had no intention of starting a startup, but over a bunch of conversations, we realized there was a, this really big issue that both of, us, both of us were passionate about, both of us who had either friends, family who were affected by it, and also both of us had discovered potential ways to solve. Uh, via technology that nobody else had been able to execute well in Malaysia. So that's how we started. And beyond that, it just grew because this concept about efficiency and safety in taxis wasn't something that just Malaysia had to deal with. Uh, we went on to Manila and the Philippines, Vietnam, Indonesia, Bangkok. Uh, we're now in six countries, 30 cities but not just in taxis anymore. So now that we've been able to reform and reshape the industry, uh, it's become significantly safer, significantly more efficient. We've now moved into, as you said, cars, motorbike taxis, deliveries, carpooling, uh, and a whole bunch of different things. So on let's the just talk about the scale of Grab. You now have 300,000 drivers in those six countries. And growing. 15 million devices have the app. Yep. I think you say about one in nine smartphone users in Southeast Asia are active users mm -hmm. of Grab. You say that Grab is now the biggest homegrown tech company in the region. Yes. How do you account for, in four years, becoming the big one? I would say a lot of good luck, a lot of great people, and a shared vision, right? After hearing the story that I just shared about where we started, to be very frank and honest, um, we never expected to be where we are today. If you were to ask me, hey, Ling, you know, when you first started my taxi, do you think it was gonna become the unicorn of Southeast Asia? Did you think that you're gonna be on the RISE conference, you know, talking about your experience? I would have said, absolutely no. 
Uh, why? Because that wasn't why we started the company, but at the same time, because it was such a good solution to the local challenges that all our consumers, be it drivers or passengers, face. We grew so quickly. We grew out of demand, and we grew out of our ability to execute on solving the challenges and that demand that I talked about. And what are the particular qualities of the region that you think you understood and your competitors didn't necessarily understand? So you shared earlier, six countries, 30 cities. Southeast Asia is extremely fragmented. When you say six countries and 30 cities, I oftentimes think of it as 30 countries. Because even if you were to go to two different cities in Vietnam or Indonesia or Philippines, they would end up having very different cultures, heritage, culture, um, language, even sometimes religion, right? Local governments are different. So it is a very fragmented market that has underlying similarities. So what you really need to do to succeed in a market like Southeast Asia is to understand that respect it and leverage those differences to actually build something that could be regional. And that means putting the language in local languages and also taking money in the form that people locally who may not have credit cards want to pay you. So a couple of things that you mentioned that are great, right? One is Southeast Asia is a cash-based economy. 95% um, of individuals use cash, prefer cash, only 5% use credit cards. And even if they use it, they don't want to put it on some app, right? Uh, that, in addition to the fact that there's so many different languages, what we did at Grab when we first started is we started monetizing on a cash-based economy. We started taking cash from our drivers, getting them to transact, creating a credit wallet for our drivers so that they could have credits to continue accepting jobs. Beyond that, we also have local teams in each of our six countries, right? Think of these local teams as local experts. They're all staffed by the best, brightest Filipino talent, Indonesian talent, you know, Thai talent. But they all share this vision with us, which is knowing that Southeast Asia is home and knowing that there is so much more that we can do as a region that nobody else has ever even potentially considered or wanted to do in the ways that we care about. So some of the things that we do to localize for language is we actually have 24-7 customer service um, centers staffed by locals who speak multiple different languages. Um, of course, they speak English. In Malaysia, you'll get them to speak Malay. Um, in Manila, you'll get them to speak Tagalog, Cebuano, uh, and all the other different things that make us truly Southeast Asian. Now, there's one or two other companies that are growing very quickly and trying to dominate international markets. I think one of them begins with a U. How, I wonder who you're talking about. How have you managed to stay a step ahead of Uber? It's the same thing that has enabled us to get where we are today, right? We are currently the largest player in Southeast Asia because we are Southeast Asians who understand our markets. And we develop non-cookie cutter solutions. It's super segmented, localized, and tailored for what we need. So if you think about, forget about who you're talking about, just think about any other global MNC. Um, I used to do strategy consulting for a lot of them, or even worked in their strategy teams. What, they, what any company benefits from is a platform that they can leverage with minimal tweaks and nuances, right? because that's the easy thing to roll out, that's the easiest thing to maintain. What we do is actually slightly different. Yes, of course there is a platform that we're building with you know, a mapping system, a payment system, that's something that we can tweak and tailor for Southeast Asia, but at the same time, we have so many other things, be it our offline operations, um, be it how we think about payments, how we think about mapping, how we think about even our product solutions, right? We'll get a grab bike in four out of our six countries. You, grab, you get grab hitch in only two out of six right now. Why? Because we know different solutions work for different markets. You've created an international alliance with other companies that are also being challenged by Uber 
locally um, with Lyft, with Ola from India, with Didi Juk Singh. Why do you need to have an alliance? I would call it a global partnership. And let me just share a bit of a, how it started, right? It's not that we needed a partnership. It's more a formalization of like-minded leaders who are all thinking of doing the same thing, which is to transform their local markets that needed transportation improvements, right? Be it Didi in China, Ola in India, Grab Southeast Asia, Lyft in the States, all of us shared that same underlying belief and set of core values on how we wanted to bring about change. One, we knew that technology was going to revamp it. We're not the only ones in the market who are trying to do it. There are smaller players, bigger players, whatever it is, right? But why we want to do what we want to do is because we're trying to drive positive change. We're trying to bring value in a way that works for every single player in the ecosystem. And so what happens as a set of conversations between founders we decided to formalize so that our teams who were growing tremendously quickly could also share in that same conversations cross-functionally across borders to leverage the best learnings and the most innovative solutions. So you're not competing in the same territories. No. Presumably the benefits for the customer are they can use the same app to book when they're traveling on the other services. Yes, so think about this now. Um, we're in the process of integrating with different players right now. If you were to be a Grab user from Singapore, and you're making a business trip or a vacation trip to San Francisco, you will be able to open up your Grab app with your pre-saved uh, payments options, with the UI and the UX that you're extremely familiar with, land in the States, and get access to all the cars that Lyft already has signed up so that it was a completely seamless experience for you end to end. And are you sharing resources for things like lobbying? Because I know regulations are an issue in many territories. So regulations is an important local nuance and an important local strength that each of us um, has specific teams on, right? Regulatory frameworks and partners in the governments are something that I think all of us need to address differently because they're all different. If you were to go speak to the government in Malaysia versus the government in Singapore, everyone has different ways of approaching it. And even between cities in Manila or Davao, the local governments are quite different. So what we do and what we've always done at Grab is to work with these local partners. Governments to us are partners as well because we understand that whatever change that we're bringing is brand new to whichever country we're operating in. And ultimately, we share the same vision as our local governments, which is we want to make transportation more accessible, we want to make it safer and more efficient. So knowing that shared end goal, there is always ways for us to work better together. And what we then do is get into good conversations to shape what it ultimately should and could look like. But you're still challenging local pockets of power, local vested interests in many cities. How much of your time, Hu Leng, are you spending with regulators, with government officials? How much hours per week is this taking up? Not the greatest question for me, because that's not the team that I actually help oversee. But we actually have a dedicated team. Uh, they're called the public affairs team. Uh, they have strong, great relationships with our local operators and governments. And why? Because we've invested in understanding what their needs are. Um, and we always share with them what our plans in fact, we also get into partnerships with them. So right now, we recently launched a partnership with the World Bank in conjunction with several local governments to share all the great data that we've been collecting so that they can help reshape what the future of transportation in each of our cities look like. Because if you think about it, Southeast Asia has suffered from a whole ton of insufficient infrastructure investments. Uh, typical developing country story low access to 
private vehicle ownership, and therefore a whole ton of traffic jams. In Jakarta, if you go to, I guess, anywhere in the CBD to get in, it'll take you on average about three hours to get in. It's a bit of a nightmare, but unfortunately something that the local Jakarta residents have gotten used to, and something that we're trying to change with grab bike. Because instead of being stuck in your car or your taxi for three hours now, mm -hmm. what you can get is a bike that will help you weave through traffic in 20 or 30 minutes. You have this international set of partnerships, this international alliance, which doesn't include this company beginning with you. I know they've been quite aggressive in how they approach what they see as competitors in other territories. There were some early signs of this taxi war when they were growing in London and rival companies were saying there were call outs to cabs when it wasn't for a customer. Um, how clean have Uber been playing towards Grab? So I won't comment specifically on what your practices are, but what I will share is how we think about the way we want to run our business and ultimately what our end goal is. At Grab, we're in it for the long run. We're building a business that we want to reshape Southeast Asia's future with technology. We want to be the Alibaba, the Tencent of Southeast Asia, doing things that nobody have ever envisioned possible before. And because of that, we do it in ways that we know we can go to bed sleeping well at night. Uh, we do it in conjunction with our local partners, thinking about what our customers need, both our drivers as well as our passengers, because ultimately, we live in these countries, so we want to develop solutions that are most suited for it. So you're in six countries now. How many, ultimately, will you be in? Well, there are 11 countries in Southeast Asia. Um, we are extremely focused in Southeast Asia, and there are no immediate plans or medium-term plans to go beyond. Why? Because Southeast Asia is a huge opportunity. Um, I'm not sure if many of you have seen, Google and Tomasek recently launched some data on how, south, how big the Southeast Asian market is, how relatively untapped it is, and therefore why it's a humongous opportunity. For us, we've known that for quite a while now. Um, Southeast Asia has a population of more than 620 million people. If you think about it in aggregate, that's larger than North America or even the EU combined. We have a ton of megacities, four of which are larger than New York City. And we have a burgeoning middle class, all of which are jumping straight to smartphones for internet access. So because of that, there is a humongous opportunity that's you know, available to us, and we are invested into shaping that for the future. And are you investing in new kinds of technology to allow these cars, these bikes, to drive themselves? So the whole conversation on SDVs, I think, is... Self-driving vehicles. Thank you, David. Self-driving vehicles, I think it's a great technology that all of us should be keeping an eye out on. Um, but acknowledging that Southeast Asia countries like Vietnam, Jakarta, where you have bikes weaving in and out, going against traffic rules, cutting each other in like, you know, 10 different directions. It's going to be significantly more challenging for SDVs to actually maneuver through our roads, especially when they're full of potholes too. So although I know that it is something that we're eagerly anticipating to see how it's going to reshape the industry, we also know that for the foreseeable future, they're not going to be in Southeast Asia impacting it the same way that they may, let's say, in New York City anytime soon. So you're not buying robotics departments from leading universities? Not at the moment. Tell me if, I've, if you have any good ones we should look at. Not many left, I think. <laughs> you collect a lot of data. In fact, you're a tech business rather than a transport business. How are you using this data? What kind of insights are you gaining? So I shared a bit about just understanding better traffic patterns, our partnership with the World Bank, but specifically on how we use it, right? Let me share an example about you know, the differences between grab bike or grab car and grab taxi. Again, using the example in Jakarta, 
bikes are able to weave through some of the tiniest roads you'll ever see. They're able to cut through traffic and find unique routes like nobody has ever done, right? At the same time, they can't access highways. So how are we using this data? We're trying to provide the best routing services for our drivers so that it's tailored towards bikes and cars. Ultimately, what this means for our passengers is more efficient allocations of whatever vehicle they're looking for. Faster services getting you from point A to point B, or even point B to point A when you're looking for delivery services. Mm -hmm. That's just one example. Um, beyond that, you know, there's a lot of data we're also collecting in terms of the payments behaviors of our customers. I shared earlier, Southeast Asia is a cash-based uh, cash economy. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to be the case going forward because we can already see that change. Grab has now been in the market for four years. Four years may seem like a very long time or a very short time, depending on who you speak to. And what ultimately we have been able to do is get you know, the trust of our consumers because they understand that we're in it for the long run. They know that we treat their data with respect. And therefore, when we launched our cashless payment system called GrabPay, where you can either use credit cards or debit cards, we actually see a much higher engagement level on our system and platform compared to something else that you see in other typical e-commerce setups. As you say, it's only four years, yet you're the biggest locally grown tech business in the region. What's been the most surprising part of this journey for you? You started out on the path to become a McKinsey consultant. You were working with McKinsey and Salesforce. You were going to become a mechanical engineer. So it's probably not what you thought you were going to be. But what surprised you on the way? A lot of things. Every single day is a surprise. Um, I think. One of the surprises I shared earlier was just our ability to get to where we are to get today, right? Why? Because it's not because of what Anthony and I have done or what we can do, but more because of the great fellow grabbers and individuals we've been able to attract along this journey. It's been extremely surprising and heartening to know that so many other Southeast Asians actually care about the same problems that we do. And I actually want to invest a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into solving it. We don't know the answers. We have no idea what every single day is going to look like. But what we are invested in doing is to make sure every single day we know what our guiding principles are, what our North Star is, and the fact that we are continuously going to learn and iterate and grow together to make Grab a much better company that will shape Southeast Asia's future. future. And give some final lessons to people here thinking of doing business in the region. I mean, share some of the secrets. <clears throat> How much are you willing to pay? Um, you know, I've, I've shared a bunch of different lessons with different individuals before. And let me just step back and say that a lot of what I can share is not because of what we have done specifically as individuals. We're extremely fortunate. There's a lot of luck in any business that you start, right? So I'm just going to start with that baseline, because sometimes I feel as if I have no right to be giving advice. But for those of you who have already started startups, who are thinking of starting startups, be very, very clear of why you want to do it. Um, it is not an easy journey. You can look at, I guess, my conversation with David right now and say, wow, isn't that super cool? You know, in four years, she has been able to help build one of the greatest companies in Southeast Asia. And I say, hey, those four years have been extremely painful. It's been extremely rewarding. Every day I still want to do it, but it comes at a cost, right? And that cost is only worth it if you're extremely passionate about why you are doing what you're doing. For us, we started with safety, taxis. It then evolved to knowing that we now have the responsibility of shaping Southeast Asia. And we now have the responsibility of helping local talent in Southeast Asia grow in ways that other people have never seen. So be clear. If you're looking for you know, a quick buck, 
please, entrepreneurship is not it. There are much faster ways of earning money, be it a McKinsey consultant or a Goldman Sachs investment banker. Um, all of them pay much more than Grab, FYI. Uh, but knowing that and being committed to what you're doing, working hard, knowing that you're always going to be proven wrong, you're going to learn 101 lessons each day. It's an accelerated growth path. Um, be ready for all of that. You talk about the pain. I mean, was there one particular moment where some awful situations had all come together and you thought, I don't know if we're going to make it? Give us one example of some really tough moment. And there was a point in time where technology started. Okay, let me just frame this, right? One, knowing that we're the first Southeast Asian startup, homegrown, that's actually built any sort of scalable technology platform. Two, about two years ago, there was a point in time where our infrastructure was collapsing. It was actually a very nice problem to have. Why? Because we're having so much demand that we just were not prepared for. But it was one of those days where we used to call it like the Black Thursday or the Black Monday when things came crashing down and you're like, oh my God, will we ever be able to get it up again? And how will we be able to cope with this continuous growth that we are seeing and not expecting? Those were the days where you're like, okay, do we have the right local talent to make this work? How do we iterate? How do we learn from this? How do we continue to grow? And how we've evolved post that is to actually invest in global talent that care about our localized solutions. So now we have three R&D centers, all focused on engineering and tech. One, of course, in Singapore, that's our hub. And we also have offices in Seattle and Beijing. Why? Because those are locations which are super close to the best talent in the world, who have seen it for decades, who have been involved in creating such of uh, some of the largest tech platforms, be it Amazon, Facebook, Google, Twitter, right, or Alibaba and Tencent. Those are the kind of talent who love the challenges that we're facing in Grab and love that they get to participate in it from their local countries. So far, it seems to be working. Don't give up. Tan Wheeling of Grab. Thank you. Thank you, folks. Thanks, David.